Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, bringing you Arizona football, Arizona State, uh, Sun Devils with, uh, of course, Jordan K from House of Sparky, who's joined us a few times to break down the Sun Devils and uh, some interesting uh, perspective on Herm Edwards in particular. So, of course, uh, that's one of the headline stories in the Pac-12 as we enter 2018. Herm Edwards, and is he going to be able to handle this job in this football program? Jordan, how are you doing today? I'm not too bad. How are you? Doing just uh, fine. So, of course, uh, join Jordan and the rest of the staff there at House of Sparky for Arizona State sports coverage. Uh, the recruiting rankings don't look great right now for 2019, but they really don't mean much. Uh, seventh in the Pac-12, number 64 in the country. But again, that's a long ways away. So it's more about uh, who are the targets? Are you in the running and who is committed recently? And it's been a pretty good two or three weeks for you. Yeah, they've gotten five kids in the last two weeks. And and that was one of the things we, we talked with um, Al Luganville, who's the director of player personnel, which, as you might know, sounds like an NFL title, which Herm Edwards kind of is. But it's really just the, a recruiting director, recruiting coordinator for ASU. And, and he mentioned a couple at the beginning of June that, that ASU is behind in the class of 2019. Um, the last two weeks, though, they've grabbed five commitments, uh, two in state. And I think the biggest part of that is they got two quarterbacks, and and that's kind of a position they really need to to hammer down after Manny Wilkins leaves this year. They got a three star in uh, Ethan Long from Oregon uh, to really kind of kick off that class of nineteen commitment. Then got Joey Yellen, I think two days later from Cal California. He's a four star, um, probably the likely to start in two years. Um, but then they followed it up with some some interesting. Commitments. They got uh, Roman DeWeiss. Um, he's an offensive lineman, but the interesting thing about him is he's only 16 years old. And that was one of the things that Luganville said is they're not really looking for guys who are peaking at the age of 17 or 18. They're looking for guys who hopefully can peak when they're 21 and 22. So they're trying to recruit a lot on, on potential and not too worried about star ratings, but in, instead looking at, at height and size and stuff like that and really trying to formulate a team um, formulate a recruiting class that's built around that and with the hope that their coaches can develop these kids into the kind of players that they want and develop them in to four and five stars but maybe they're not recruited that way so jordan when i hear the name lugan bill do you have any idea as to whether he's related to tom lugan bill the espn recruiting analyst yes he is his, his dad okay yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So um, Tom Lugan, Bill, a guy that I respect greatly. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's an interesting, it's just the complete pro model of an yep. organization from top to bottom in regards to personnel and player development and in uh, analysis and scouting. So it's a uh, pretty fascinating because Herm Edwards doesn't come across and this is not a knock, but he doesn't come across as the analytical type. Yeah. Obviously pro sports are going in that direction and have been for a number of years Wow. Uh, but he seems to be uh, with with the agreement that was set up between he and the AD, um, the, being able to try to, I guess, play on his strengths as a CEO, yeah. a visionary, a guy that inspires and connects uh, on the relationship basis, and then bring in the the analytics people. Yeah, they. So an interesting thing that they did they they gather all the coaches in this big conference room. Uh, at Sun Devil Stadium, it, and they all sit down, all of them together, offense, defense, whatever, and watch film on different guys. And that's recruits as well as guys who are already on the team. And and one of the big things that like Luganville was talking about is is they do it so that if a defensive guy is watching for what the offensive coach likes, then when he's scouting high school teams specifically for a defensive player, he can also look and understand what the offensive coaches might want. So he's looking at some wide receivers, but maybe he coaches DBs, and he understands what the coaches, every coach wants at their specific position so they can kind of, uh, I guess, delegate and kind of talk within each other about different recruits. And that was one of the things I found really interesting. They also said that Luganville said in three to five years he thinks he could ASU could be formulated of 80% kids just from Arizona and California, which seems absolutely bizarre. But when you really think about it, it's possible. Um, they set up a real big base of recruiting in specifically Arizona, 
California, Nevada. Uh, I think he even said Hawaii. But it's so they're really not trying to go too far out of their boundaries. You'll hardly ever see them uh, trying to recruit a kid from Alabama, Florida. It's, it's mostly the farthest east they'll go is probably Louisiana, where running backs coach uh, John Simon has ties. Um, they just got an athlete uh, who's likely to play DB, Ty Armanen from Texas. So that's something you'll probably see a lot more of is them trying to really stick within a boundary. They said they have uh, eight coaches that are uh, eight of their coaches that are just spread across California recruiting there. Then they have a bunch of all those coaches kind of compile and get together um, to work in Arizona. And then uh, they have one coach that kind of the offensive line coach that really just roams everywhere because, as they said, offensive line they can come from anywhere. Now, when you spit out, uh, I think the number was 85% uh, would be the target uh, down the road, three to five years of having 85% of the roster from Arizona and California. Was that the number, 85? 80, but yeah. 80%, okay. Yeah. Uh, when, when you spit out Arizona, I thought that was going to be crazy. Then you threw in California, and uh, certainly that's one of the top three recruited states in the nation yeah. uh, between California, Florida, and Texas. They, over the past several years, have produced 40% of the elite players, meaning the top three to 500 in America. So uh, that I can believe. I, I That might be a bit of a stretch, but yeah. that's that's certainly um, viable. Yeah. Um, we're going to digress here just a second, Jordan. So we've got somebody on the live chat who is a great college football fan, Navy Thomas 8. Uh, he's, he's wondering about uh, you tying maybe a better wins or not into your tie. Now, I'm looking at it for, from a guy who used to wear a tie every day, that that's about as good as I was able to accomplish in any particular day in <laughs> tying a tie myself. Oh, the tie? No, I tie? think it's a good look. Oh, yeah. you See, you tie it once. And then you just you kind of you don't untie it all. Oh, those the guys. Yeah, it's it's kind of a cheat code. Well, if you can do it, the, most of us can't pull that off because you. Yeah. You, you, you take it off and, and it clears the neck, and you can't uh, continue to do that. But uh, it's a good look, definitely, right Thanks. there. So we got a comment. That was the first comment on the chat. Actually, it had to do with the, the attire. So so that's a good thing. But also. The second comment was uh, enjoy hearing the uh, Arizona State analysis from you. So, awesome. so that's a good thing to hear. Um, so I, I'm going to digress here, and you're probably not going to have any in-depth analysis of this game per se, but uh, the Michigan State visit out to Arizona State, as somebody uh, lists here on the live stream, is obviously an intriguing game and a game that um, is important not just for Arizona State, but also – for the Pac-12's perception oh. of play coming off the postseason issues last year. Washington out of the gate against Auburn. That's another one that uh, you would think that the Pac-12 may need in a college football playoff scenario in terms of consideration. And Arizona State, Michigan State, uh, quality team coming to uh, uh, Tempe, and it uh, should be a good game. Yeah, good. Because Michigan State, if you, they were kind of ranked at the end of the season. Is that correct? Oh, Five. yeah. They were 10-3, and three, uh, number 15 in the country. Yeah, and ASU's had uh, relatively good success against those big-time schools. Um, they beat Wisconsin, I believe it was three or four years ago. They beat Notre Dame at home, I think, three years ago. They lost it to them in Dallas um, the year before that. Uh, but this is a very big game, especially because it's kind of the first real test of the Herm Edwards era. This is kind of going to show people, okay, is this for real or is this kind of just a, a joke that's really going to just show itself very quickly? Now, I don't think ASU is going to win that game. Um, I don't think many ASU fans do. But if there's one interesting thing. I mean, Michigan State's quarterback, Brian Lewerke, he went to Pinnacle High School in Phoenix. Um, he's actually good friends, I believe, with uh, ASU quarterback Manny Wilkins. Um, so that's an interesting dynamic of the game. Um, but it'll, it's definitely a big thing for the Pac-12. You mentioned the Washington-Auburn game. Um, this could really set the tone for the Pac-12 down the line. And I think ASU, they're really projecting themselves to they're not, they know they're not going to be great next year, possibly even the year after that. They're really trying to project this thing a couple years down the road and that's where they really need to build up and the whole conference really needs to build itself up by winning some of these games and and showing that they can kind of compete with the bigger conferences the big 10 the sec um so i think it's very important in that respect and asu will travel to east lansing 
the year after that. Um, but this could really be the tone setter for the entire season and possibly even the chances of the Pac-12 getting a representative in the playoff. It's been a quick decline for the conference. If you just go back to 2014, arguably, just based on the results on the field, nobody necessarily believed this, but you could argue, based on the results on the field and the metrics, that the Pac-12 was the best conference in the nation. The SEC still considered the best, but the Pac-12 was right there, uh, had a sterling out-of-conference record that particular season, and it's just kind of... uh, a run off the slope ever since and culminated by this one in seven finish in postseason play last year. And uh, as you mentioned, when the college football playoff committee looks at things at the end of the season, certainly if Washington, for example, wins the PAC 12, they go undefeated or have a loss within the conference or even that Auburn game. And they're just the clear cut uh, fourth team versus the other conferences. Then they're going to get the selection regardless of what the perception of the conference is. But the conference perception may come into play like it did last year with USC losing two games, but not getting any consideration as a conference champion. If the PAC 12 is not able to turn this around and you mentioned those two games in particular, and obviously USC and Stanford playing Notre Dame and USC with a date against Texas and all those games will factor in heavily. I'm just uh, curious to look at Arizona state's track record in recent years against uh, some of the better power five teams uh, last season, obviously not a power five, but a really good top 25 team was San Diego State, and they lost that game uh, yeah. at home by 10 points. They, of course, got ripped by North Carolina State in the bowl game, uh, lost to Texas Tech in a shootout by a touchdown. If you go yeah. back to 27 16, uh, 68 55 against Texas Tech. That was a win. I remember that game as a shootout, of course. 2015 uh, eight touchdowns in that game uh set an oh yes fbs record that was that game absolutely that's right 2015 uh there was a lot of hype surrounding the game against texas a&m that got out of hand lost it by three touchdowns 38 17 in houston had a date against west virginia really good bowl game very um entertaining 45 42 loss to the mountaineers at the end of the season in bowl play. Uh, let's see, 2014, uh, there was a big win over Duke to conclude the season. Uh, that was really the last, uh, had to be the last ranked team. So Todd Graham went 10 and three that year. That team finished like 12th or 13th in the country, something in that range. And yep. yeah, they beat, um, they beat Duke, uh, 36, 31 in that one in particular. And I'll just, uh, run back one other season. You mentioned the Wisconsin game. Oh yeah. That was the controversial, uh, the the, the of play the inside down. like the 10 or 15 yard line. That's right. Yep. Yep. As soon as I saw the score, it reminded me. Yeah. Some people don't uh, exactly count that as a win, but it goes down that way. In the, hey, in the, hey. The, the way I look at it is you can't count it as a loss. Certainly it did um, very true. possibly negate Wisconsin an opportunity. And I felt the same way. I felt that they should have had one more play, but you don't know right. that they're going to score. They had like eight or 10 yards to cover. They yeah. weren't sitting at the half yard line, but uh, they beat a really good Wisconsin team that year, 32 30. And uh, Texas Tech was the bowl game at the end of the season. And I remember they were a big favorite in that game by a couple yeah. scores. Like, and I think that's one of the things, too. I've always been fascinated with because um, they lost to Stanford that year in the Pac 12 championship game. And I think sometimes if a team loses a champion conference championship game, I really don't know how much uh, incentive they have that uh, in that bowl game. And I think that was one of the things where Texas Tech really wanted to be there. And I'm not exactly sure ASU did. Yeah, you go from Holiday Bowl or Rose Bowl to Holiday Bowl with the loss to uh, Stanford. And if I remember, it was close. And then Stanford owned the fourth quarter and they win 38-14. And I'll just take it back one other year because it was a nice year for Arizona State. Uh out of conference, defeating Illinois out of the Big Ten by 31 points. They beat Missouri uh, at that point. That was their first year in the SEC. No, they lost to Missouri 24 to 20, but they did win a bowl game against the Navy 62 28. All yeah. right, there's there's a look back at Arizona uh, State football, but just, uh, uh, that's something I could do forever: rummage through old scores and remember games. Uh, those in the last five years, Arizona State football. So a mixed bag of. Uh, performance against the uh, other power fives. So uh, let's look at the quarterback and the wide receiver situation coming into 2018, because before we came on the live stream, I mentioned uh, previewing some positions as we've discussed over the last couple of weeks. 
And uh, Jordan, you mentioned that the quarterback situation was going to be interesting. And that I found that kind of odd knowing that uh, Jordan Wilkins is in play. So uh, set us up at the quarterback spot. Yeah. So Manny Wilkins is, is obviously going to be the, the starting quarterback. That That's no surprise, but, but they've lost three guys in the past year, uh, almost year to transferring uh, Bryce Perkins. He went to Arizona Western, a community college. Now he's going to be the starter at Virginia. Brady White, who who was injured last season, but during practice and stuff, just when he would throw, um, not really doing any dropbacks, he looked like he had pr- possibly the best arm on the team. I thought that if he was healthy, there was a chance that he could have started. And then obviously the former Alabama quarterback, Blake Barnett, um, transfers to USF. Um, that'll be interesting to see how he does there. But right now, it, it really leaves them just limited in depth. They've got Wilkins, who's been a two-year starter. Um, he's going to go into his third year. Last season, it was it was pretty much solid. I, I believe he was the last quarterback in the country to throw an interception. He did that against Stanford, where he had two. But he threw for, uh, what was it? Almost 3,000 yards, had 17 touchdowns, only five interceptions. He's a very reliable guy, but this is going to be his fourth offensive coordinator in four years, which isn't easy for any quarterback. So it's going to be interesting to see how he uses that playbook. Then behind him, there's really, it's going to be interesting if Wilkins does go down. Um, They've got junior Dylan Sterling Cole who had a few starts um, during his freshman campaign just because Wilkins and Brady White and Bryce Perkins were all injured. It was kind of throwing him into the fire. And then Ryan Kelly, a freshman, a redshirt freshman who really doesn't have any experience. Uh, So that's, I think, why it was so important for them to get those two recruits early in the 2019 class because before that there were a lot of question marks at quarterback and especially in recruiting. They lost out, lost out to uh, Tyler Holinsky, um to South Carolina. Then they lost to Jacob Conover, the uh, Valley local kid who went to BYU or committed to BYU, I should say. And so getting Ethan Long and getting Joey Yellen was, was kind of this, uh, I guess, reassurance that under center they have options going forward. And, and before that, before those commitments, they really didn't. So – I, this is going to be Wilkins' year. This is Wilkins' team. He's going to really guide the offense. Um, it'll be interesting to see, though, if they they try and air the ball out a little more um, and try and go for a more vertical passing game rather than uh, what they did last year, which was a, a lot of slants, a lot of screen passes, a lot of dump offs, and just trying to get some short yardage. And Wilkins actually broke the 3,000-yard barrier once he threw for 352 against yep. North Carolina State in the bowl game, threw three yep. touchdowns in that game to finish with 20. Uh, on the other side, uh, three interceptions, which uh, he only had five coming into the game, three against the Wolfpack to finish with eight. And yep. your point's well taken because if you just uh, – we won't even look across the nation just in the Pac-12 in this past season. Justin Herbert gets uh, injured at Oregon. Uh, Stanford uh, can't get KJ Costello through the entire season. If you go back two years, obviously Max Brown faltered and Sam Darnold was waiting in the wings to provide the Rose Bowl run for USC. And you can look across the conference in the nation and see where the backup quarterback, obviously when he doesn't step on the field, he's the least important guy in the roster. Then he becomes suddenly the most important guy on the roster in the span of one play. So um, interesting there, Manny Wilkins looking for a big breakout uh, final season um, for Arizona State as they uh, look to get back to postseason play. We got Jordan K on the line from House of Sparky. Of course, this is Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Please subscribe, comment, and like. That helps out the channel and the YouTube metrics and analytics in regards to boosting uh, our videos and uh, trying to give you the best look at college football entering 2018 with the very best in discussion, debate, and uh, analysis. So we talked quarterback. Let's do the natural transition to wide receiver and your thoughts about 2018. Yeah, I mean, the group really starts and ends with Nikhil Harry um, going into his junior season. People talk to him a little bit during the spring and it seems like if he has even a relatively good year, he's going to the draft. This is kind of his last hurrah. Um, he was a Chandler kid. This is kind of the hometown hero getting this, I guess, this finishing stretch and possibly could be a first-round pick, the first since 
Demarius Randall went to uh, the Packers a couple years ago. Uh, but Harry's just an absolute stud. He's 6'4", he's over 215 pounds, um, and he'll just make a couple circus catches every game. And if they really want to execute this vertical passing game, he's going to be one of the guys that can do it. You wouldn't think at his size that he would be able to, to get downfield as quick as he does, but it's really quite – it's amazing how fast he can get down there and really just go up and get balls that he's beaten safeties and corners at getting. Um, last season, he had uh, over a thousand yards, a thousand in the regular season, seven touchdowns. He had a, another one in the bowl game, and he's really going to be the star for that. Uh, the, the unit, though, does lose Jalen Harvey. He was kind of their third down guy. Most of his receptions came on third down, always gave him a first down. Uh, he's actually moving to safety this year, a move that he made himself um, to really try and um, boost his draft stock or at least try and get in contention for getting drafted. That's a big loss. They also have John Humphrey, who got injured in the spring. I believe he's going to be out for the entire year. So that really limits their downfield presence. They have Kyle Williams, who's a, a very capable receiver. Um, a little smaller, so not going to go up and get balls uh, like Nikhil Harry. Um, then it's interesting. They've got just a, a bunch of guys who they can use in different situations. And I, I think that's the biggest thing. In spring, we saw a lot of guys rotating in and out. And that's going to be what it is. It's not going to be a set unit where every guy's going in. They've got Frank Darby, who's an unbelievable downfield thread, who really in spring maybe wouldn't have a ton of catches, but everyone seemed to go for a long touchdown. Uh, they have Curtis Hodges, who's going to be a sophomore. He's six foot seven, so your ideal uh, red zone target, just a guy to throw the ball up to, and he can go get it. Um, they have Ryan Newsom, who transferred from, I believe uh, it was Oklahoma. He's going to be a guy who can just kind of go and do everything. So I think that's really ASU's position group. It's a lot of versatility, a lot of guys who can do things, and it's very specific things so that there's going to be a lot of rotation for each play. They're going to have their set out there who they really want. Yeah, so I think we had uh, talked about that a few months ago in regards to the safety position being a bit thin, and therefore uh, that prompted the move of a – uh, as you mentioned, Jake Harvey with 33 catches and a touchdown. He was third on the team in receiving yards, making that yeah. move over to safety to help the team. Yep. Uh, Nikhil Harry, 82 catches. And you mentioned the other numbers and what he's able to do downfield. And obviously, he's a prime NFL prospect. Kyle Williams, 66, seven touchdowns. Yeah. So uh, there's the uh, take on wide receivers at uh, Arizona State with. Uh, we got Jordan K on the line from House of Sparky, and uh, as somebody on the chat uh, referenced and uh, is tabbing the matchup uh, with uh, Michigan State, it would be Sparty versus Sparky. So maybe <laughs> you can run with that. <laughs> uh, we might have to after that. All Maybe right. Uh, good stuff with, uh, again, Jordan K. If you love Arizona State football, if you just uh, follow the Pac-12 or the nation and want to keep track of everyone, just check out uh, House of of Sparky on the SB Nation at platform for Arizona State Athletics. We have broken down the quarterbacks and the wide receivers. We will hopefully get back together with Jordan in the next several weeks and continue our positional breakdowns. And uh, the recruiting has been good to Herm Edwards and the Sun Devils as well. So if you're jumping on the live stream a little bit late, especially catch the beginning of the video after it uh, processes and posts here in the next few minutes. Uh, good take from Jordan on the Herm Edwards approach and the player personnel uh, approach to uh, Arizona State uh, developing players and building the program. Jordan, we appreciate you stopping by. Thank you so much for having me.